meteorite enter, it has a, a much larger velocity than the speed of sound, so it will create a, a Mach cone. Uh, in this case, uh, we will consider the propagation to be perpendicular to the um, trajectory. It could also originate from a fragmentation event, so uh, when the meteorite broke up into uh, several pieces, or uh, from a final airburst, which is the complete disintegration of uh, the meteorite in the atmosphere. And in both these two last cases, we will have uh, omnidirectional propagation or um, quasi-spherical propagation. But we can also detect um, seismic surface wave uh, when we have the couple with um, the shock wave with the ground and uh, they will convert into a seismic uh, Rayleigh wave. And in the case of uh, an impact with the ground of the meteorite, we can have as well uh, seismic body waves. Okay, so in this study, uh, we focused on uh, three different events, two natural ones, D21, D19, and uh, the main main object is the re-entry of the Ayabusa 2 sample return capsule, and they're both located in uh, South uh, Australia. Uh, about the data, so all the trajectory are provided by the DFN, and I recover uh, the seismic one, uh, so from the <coughs> sorry, a national uh, seismic uh, sensor from Australia, the AU network, and uh, also got access to two restricted and temporary network, which are the 5G and the 6K one. So I have this uh, really dense uh, network of seismic station, which is pretty rare in Australia uh, otherwise. Uh, so the processing, uh, so here I will explain you what I've done uh, through the example of uh, Ayabusa 2. So mainly I remove the instrumental response and I apply a uh, frequency band filtering. It means uh, I filter my data in a uh, narrow frequency band, uh, starting at 0 0.01 and up to 20 hertz. Here uh, on this figure, you can see uh, three different graphs which correspond to the three components of the seismic sensor, so the vertical, the north, and the east one. Uh, after that, I wanted to compute a theoretical arrival time. Uh, so of the shock wave um, that originate from different uh, points of interest along the fireball trajectory. So of course I have the start, the end uh, from the tra DFN trajectory. I also wanted to uh, extend this uh, start and end from three kilometers on the ground to have the extended one. I computed the shortest distance between the fireball trajectory and uh, my seismic station, so this one. And in the case of uh, Ayabusa 2, we had a supplementary point, which is uh, this one, the start uh, of the silence flight. And uh, yeah, I use a constant speed of sound of uh, 340 uh, meters second. And I also roughly wanted to uh, look at the coupled uh, wave. So uh, in this case, I use the last test point that I have, so uh, directly uh, propagating perpendicular to the ground and then converting into a Rayleigh wave uh, to the seismic station. Oops, sorry. Um, and yeah, basically after what I've done is plotted uh, my theoretical arrival time on uh, my frequency band filter data. Uh, here is uh, what I've got for Ayabusa 2. So this is just one component, the vertical one here, because usually is the best one. And what you can see here is that under this uh, blue line that corresponds to the theoretical arrival time of the silent flight, uh, I have a nice peak here. If I zoom, this is what I got. Uh, so I was really happy, but I would like to ensure that I was really looking at uh, the signal coming from the, uh, the uh, Ayabusa 2 re-entry. So uh, I've done some uh, validation step. I look at the shape of the signal. So here I have a, a pretty uh, short uh, signal duration. I have this characteristic uh, WV shape and also no feature of PNS wave that are usually uh, observed for a natural earthquake. So here, thanks to the literature, I can say that I'm looking at the direct couple air wave. Uh, then, thanks to the dense network, I was able to cross-correlate um, the signal of my station, uh, and I got some uh, really interesting uh, correlation coefficient. For example, here, 0.99, knowing that the correlation coefficient of uh, one means that the two signals are uh, perfectly similar. 
So here again, uh, I was happy. I was looking at the same signal everywhere. And finally, I looked at uh, the polarization of the signal. Uh, so it's mean the direction of arrival of the signal at my seismic station. And here again, uh, everything was pointing towards the Ayabusa 2 trajectory and uh, more especially uh, here to the start of the silent flight. So yeah, this is my result for Ayabusa 2. Uh, so we detected the direct uh, shock wave from the start of the silent flight. And for my natural event, uh, so sometimes it worked pretty well. Uh, as for DN21, uh, here I have really nice signal with a really clear uh, arrival of the shock wave here that here seems to match the theoretical arrival time of the end of the trajectory. But in other case, cases, sorry, it doesn't work. As for DN19, I don't really see a clear signal and have just really noisy data. So yeah, this is what I've done so far. So what I can conclude is just that uh, I detected uh, for both the natural event and uh, the sample return capsule reentry the direct couple air wave, uh, and they were or originating from slightly different part of the trajectory. But most of the time, uh, we saw that they come from the end of the trajectory. Uh, and of course, next step will be to increase uh, the, the accuracy of uh, my estimation of the location of those uh, shockwaves along the trajectory, uh, mainly by including uh, wind models in my analysis. And yeah, I also want to try to do some ray tracing using uh, the InfraGas software. And uh, we also think about uh, looking at the fireball, uh, GFN fireball detection with uh, infrasound data because uh, it will be easier in Australia as we don't have such dense seismic network as you can have in Europe. And uh, it will be also really interesting if we, if we want to look at energy estimation or energy masses. Uh, yeah, that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, shedding light on some different topic than we had in the past days. Um, so there's room for questions. There's one. Uh, for your uh, natural event, not for higher booster reentry, uh, do you have uh, any small signal for direct arrival of Mahcon? Uh, I, you I, you said that uh, you found the main uh, arrival from the end point from uh, of trajectory, but uh, are there any uh, evidences of signal from uh, direct uh, from the shortest uh, distance uh, to the trajectory from Mahcon? Uh, I think the shock wave that we record is from the Macon is just that it can uh -huh. propagate. OK, really so it was uh, yeah. the shortest distance to the trajectory. Yes, thank yeah. you. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is that uh, you mentioned that you use a constant uh, speed of sound. Uh, how much would it change the model uh, to use a continuously changing uh, one? And the the other uh, question is that uh, what's the main difference with uh, analyzing a natural uh, meteor event and uh, an artificial one like uh, you said with uh, Hayabusa? Uh, so for the speed of sound, I don't know how, it, how much it will change. Uh, I will discover that. Uh, but I think it can change a bit, uh, especially um, because you can have a sort of waveguide in the atmosphere. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the second again, sorry? Yeah, the, the second was uh, that uh, was the main difference uh, between modeling an artificial meteor, uh, like with uh, Hayabusa and, uh, and the natural uh, body. Uh, so or, far, or is, uh, there, is there any uh, yeah, significant that, that difference? That was the goal, uh, to see if there will be a difference or not. Uh, so far, I didn't see uh, any difference, uh, maybe because the natural events were not fragmented. This is also something we really would like to try to see if we can have a difference between uh, fragmentation uh, signal in the seismic data or mm -hmm. uh, just monolithic type event. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks once more uh, for this nice talk. Thank you.